Hello everyone, I'm Bartolo from Gallery Teachers and here we talk about TEFL, that is teaching English as a foreign language. You want to leave your job, open a website, start selling your English courses, travel the world and be happy. How do you do that? Our very special guest for today is Joga Konga of ELT Training. She's a very successful course creator. She used to work at university and uh, two months ago she decided to leave her job that she liked very much, by the way, because she wanted to focus on uh, selling her own courses. Joe, I'm very excited to have you here. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Hi, Bartolo. It's really nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank I'm sorry I'm a little bit croaky today. I've got a bit of a sore throat, but uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Don't worry. We have a lot to talk about. I was checking your website. And it's uh, very good. And uh, I really like it because it's clear and you offer so many services. I wanted to understand a bit more about your story. I started teaching about 30 years ago, a long time ago, and I've taught in a lot of different contexts in private language schools and in schools and in colleges and universities. And about 10 years ago, I did an MA at Warwick. My dissertation research was about online training. Um, and it came out of the fact that I'm a CELTA trainer. I've been a CELTA trainer for about 20 years. And the research really was about the fact that I noticed that a lot of CELTA trainees were English language speakers. They, their English was their first language. And so they could speak English completely or fluently, but they didn't know what a noun was, what an adjective was, what an adverb, what a preposition was. They didn't know that nomenclature of the, the, the language because we don't tend to learn it in school in, in the UK. And so they had a problem when they were trying to explain to people the language because they didn't know the nomenclature themselves and they didn't know why it was difficult. So they didn't know what an article was and they didn't know that articles are difficult because it's just ah, and the, isn't it? it's easy. But of course, it isn't easy. So I wanted to develop a course that would help people to learn this stuff before they did CELTA. Initially, I wanted to do synchronous courses, but after a while, I, re I realised that people actually preferred to be able to self-access video material and, and learn it that way. And so I developed a course for that. It's called Grammar for Language Teachers. And since then, the website has gone on and I've made more videos. I kept making videos to promote the course and to promote the, the site. And about two months ago, I, for the first time in my life, gave up paid employment and I've become freelance. So that's quite exciting, a little bit nervous nerve-wracking um but still quite exciting yeah yeah congratulations by the way thank you i don't know if we are competitors are we competitors or i don't i don't know i don't offer tefl courses so i guess i, I offer things usually to help support people when they're doing seltzer or tefl courses so i guess we may we could think of ourselves as uh, complementary maybe yeah, I like this term. You decided to give up a job that provided you with uh, a salary because you wanted to work on uh, your own projects. What was the reason why you took this decision? Yeah, I mean, actually, it was largely about geographical freedom, is the truth. I really, I loved my job at Warwick. I worked on the MA TESOL and on BA courses. I had fantastic colleagues, a very stimulating environment. I really loved the students that we had. I honestly thought that I would continue to, to work there until I retired part-time. I only worked there 0.5 half-time. So I always did something else as well. You know, I, did, I always juggled two balls and I liked that. I liked writing. But then when COVID struck, the university offered everybody a voluntary severance. So there was a package. And also my partner is from Australia and he wants to go back there. So for me, it was a sort of a no brainer, really, because I could get the, the, the package and also then could have the freedom to live wherever we wanted to live. I'm 55. I'm getting towards an age where I perhaps don't want to be in one place. I, I really loved traveling when I was younger and then I had a family. I've got three children who are now all grown up. I think it's come to a time in my life where I'd like to be able to free to be free to go and live on a beach in Greece for a month, for example, and, um, and still be able to work. And now, given the situation with my website, and I can work wherever I want to as long as I've got a web connection of you know, Wi-Fi. You have been working on your website for the past 10 years. You know, I started it because I was interested in IT and as I did this MA, which, which focused on it. And so when I first started, in fact, when I made the course initially, 
my first thought was whether I charged for it at all or not, whether I just put it out there as a free resource. My mentor at the time was Russell Stannard. He does a lot of videos for to help teachers. All of his material is free. And so I was quite influenced by that. And I think that it's interesting if you put things out that are for free, a lot comes back to you. For me, it's certainly true that a lot has come through the website that was not directly people paying me for the course. My profile's been raised slightly. A few people know me. So I've been approached for, you know, to do other work. I'm a Cambridge assessor, so I get asked to do, to assess courses because people maybe know my site. So a lot has come to me, but my feeling was if I don't get something from it, if I don't ask people to pay for it, perhaps people don't value so much things that they get for free. And I wondered if my own motivation would continue and be sustainable if I got nothing out of it tangible. And so I put a price on it. And I think that was the right decision. It was a small amount of money. It's grown over the years, obviously, but it, it, it was just a small amount of money to start with. But it was money that I always loved to receive because it was a very personal affirmation. This person likes my things enough that they're prepared to put their hard-earned cash down for me directly. So it's not that somebody's paying the university and they're paying me. It's this person actually likes my stuff and is going to give me the money directly. And that's really a, you know, a very nice feeling, actually. So I got a lot of satisfaction out of that money always. Before you were a teacher, now working on your website, you are a teacher, a web developer, an IT guy, a businesswoman, and so many things. The stress must be very high for you. How did you learn all these things? Because there is a lot to be learned. It's not just about teaching English. My path, and I would say it's perhaps one that I would advise, is that you don't have to leap into everything, that it's really possible and probably a good idea to have two things going simultaneously for a while at least. Whilst you're working in your English teaching job, maybe also do. Do something else on the side, start a website that's easy and cheap. And you don't have to put in a lot of capital. I've never spent a lot of capital money. I've spent a lot of my time, but not an awful lot of money. So it's not expensive to set up and it doesn't require an awful lot of technical skills. I think this was something I learned very early on and it was something MA taught me, was that actually if you've got very basic IT skills, you can do it. You can make a website if you can drag and drop, basically. It's not hard. Making a good website, maybe that's slightly harder, but still, there are lots of nice templates on, you know, if you go to Weebly or Wix or various other website building tools, it's very easy to do. And there are lots of instructional videos on YouTube and things to help you. So you can learn slowly and you don't have to do it all You know, like today I'm going to give up my job and tomorrow I'm going to start a website and then it's got to pay my bills. It doesn't have to be like that. For me, it was a very slow process. So I think that that's a comforting thing that you can do it. And if you, then you might not like it. You might find actually I don't like working for myself. It's a bit insecure and it doesn't work for me. Or you might find that, yeah, this is fantastic and I'm getting really good feedback from the people that I'm teaching and they're recommending to other people and it's great for me the, the teaching that was fine and learning to teach online was different learning to make videos was different because that's a very different skill to teach in a class so I think that one was a bit different but the big one was the business thing because I wasn't perhaps still not a particularly business-minded person and so having to promote yourself I think that for me was never very natural. How about you? I mean, was that your experience? I was on uh, Facebook today and there was a woman asking for advice for a situation she had with uh, her son. And uh, the group was about book reading and uh, she was asking for a book. Incidentally, I wrote a book about that particular topic. So I said, look, if you want, this is my book. As soon as I posted that, and it was a book reading group, as soon as I posted that, somebody said, self-promotion. Yeah, obviously. And I felt very bad about that. And I was thinking, I've never promoted myself as a writer. Somebody is asking specifically for a book about a topic, and I can't say, I wrote a book, I think it's very good, you should take it. And by the way, is My son wants no pictures. You can find it online on Amazon. <laughs> Self-promotion. So I know that promoting your stuff is one of the most difficult things. How do you do that? Perhaps particularly as teachers, I feel quite uncomfortable about that whole corporate world and the advertising and pushing yourself and saying, look at me, I'm so great. You know, there's, 
and maybe being English is also, you know, we, we don't tend to like to do that. We tend to be a bit more, a bit more modest about things. We, we are suspicious, I think, of people who say, yeah, I'm so great. For me, there was a balance of things. I have a lot of free material on my, on my website, an awful lot of free material, at least about half the stuff on my website is free. And it covers things like applying for CELTA and how to do well in CELTA and, and activity to the classroom and I hope useful things because I want people to visit the site and then hopefully buy a course if they like my stuff of course there's an element of that but also there's an element of sort of feeling like I know you have this problem I know that you have this problem with not knowing the grammar I can help you but of course I can't do it for free because I've got bills to pay too I'd love to help you for free and you know here's this stuff that I will give you for free and if you like my approach then you might want to do this and I don't tend to push it too much more than that I suppose I feel comfortable in a place where I say I think you have this problem maybe you have this problem from my experience it's likely that this problem is something you will have I have experience and I think I can help you and lots of people have said to me that this course helps so you know there it is if you choose to buy it that's fine if you choose not to that's fine too and that's kind of where I feel comfortable in the marketing but it is a hard one but Facebook is where I largely you know use I use Facebook for, for advertising and so I, I haven't paid for Facebook ads yet and I'm on the cusp of thinking, should I, shouldn't I? I, I don't know. Do, do you pay for Facebook ads out of interest? With uh, Gary Teachers, I don't uh, work directly with uh, Facebook advertising, but I have other activities and uh, I noticed that if it's possible, it's better not to pay for advertising when you can afford not to pay. So if you are not paying, that means that you have to spend a lot of time online to promote to self-promote yourself another point is that you need to have this skill of uh, engaging with people and uh, finding something that they are interested in if you are that kind of person that is able to generate a lot of interest continue with that facebook likes being paid if you put an external link on uh, your activities no matter how interesting they are facebook doesn't promote you. As soon as you start paying for advertising and people show an interest in your stuff, Facebook puts all of your competitors in the same page one after another one. And uh, the advertising is uh, less effective. So it's uh, you know a combination and uh, I don't really have an answer. I paid in the past, sometimes I pay, but it's ineffective. Also because people don't like advertising. They, they don't like to be bombarded with uh, advertising. So my suggestion when uh, we discuss about paying for advertising for some activities is not to put the advertising on uh, the product, but on the content. So for example, if you have an article, a blog article that doesn't sell anything, I think it's more interesting for people to read that article and familiarize with uh, your website and later because they trust you maybe they will buy your product instead if you put a course buy my course because i'm good maybe they are not even clicking and uh, the advertising will be very expensive for you i also used youtube i mean i've been using youtube right from the beginning and i've built quite an audience not a huge audience but i've got about twenty-five thousand followers or something on youtube that certainly i think generates interest and the other thing i started about well, in September last year, was to uh, to start sending out a newsletter. Hmm. And that's been actually a joy. So in terms of marketing, I think that's been a really interesting one for me. When I thought about doing the idea of a newsletter, somebody said you should send one out every week. And I thought, really? Every week? Nobody's going to want to hear from me every week. I have a, you know, on, on my website, I've got maybe 12,000 people who've signed up to the website. So there's quite a number of people there to send a letter to. Obviously not all of them open it, but that's how many it goes out to. And I started to write this newsletter every week. And actually, I really enjoy it. I enjoy writing it because it feels like a real connection with my audience. And I get every week some, you know, some replies back um, from people who sometimes people just say thank you. But very often people, you know, send me a paragraph saying, I really enjoy your stuff or it's so helpful or I really look forward to Sunday morning and opening your web newsletter. Now, I'm sure there's not a lot of people who just ignore it, of course, or who don't like it. But you can always unsubscribe, I figure. So for me, that's been in terms of marketing, I suppose, I don't directly sell anything through the, through the newsletter. That's not quite true. My new course I did sort of promote, but rarely, it's very, very rare that I sell anything on there. I just usually say, here's something old, here's something from the website that you might like, here's something new, I make one new video a week. 
and here's something borrowed here's a web link that you might enjoy so that's kind of the structure of it but i've had really lovely feedback from pre-service teachers right up to experienced teacher trainers who've said we really like this that for me has been a bit of a joy i'm not sure how much it really affects the sales but certainly there's a, an upkeep in the users every time and new users as well as active learners on the website every sunday you also mentioned youtube this is an aspect that i never consider too much we have a channel we don't have huge numbers it's just a niche for our members by the way are you a member on uh, Gary teachers I'm, I'm not yet, no, so I probably should be. So if you want, I can uh, send you an invitation to thank you for this interview. We have uh, two webinars per week, so we have a lot of material, and I think you can also connect with uh, our members. And it's good because we start building relationships, and uh, sometimes we work on uh, different projects, and uh, there are business opportunities among us so it's a nice community that being said i'm interested in uh, youtube but at the same time i didn't explore it for marketing youtube has been bought by google and uh, now i have a feeling that it works like a search engine more than uh, social media if you post on social media your posts have uh, a very short lifespan a couple of hours and then you disappear while with uh, youtube you stay there forever i completely agree i think in terms of google search it's interesting that because my partner's recently done a bit of work on, on the SEO stuff and it has improved, but I was always, you know, I wasn't on the front page. If you, if you searched grammar for language teachers, you know, obviously there's Martin Parrott's book. So that comes up, you know, for about the first four slots. And I think if you're not on the first page, nobody looks past the first page, do they really? But as you say, it always comes up with the YouTube videos and they did come up at the top. And more and more now people are finding, I think, through Facebook, but in the past, largely it was word of mouth but through other self trainers, but also YouTube. And I think it was because of exactly as you say, the Google search, particularly for grammar for language teachers and concept checking, which is two of the things that people I think search for. And my YouTube videos come up there. How many people work uh, with you? My partner does a bit of work. With, I, basically, it's just me. It's always been me. But he's retired and he's got kind of interested in the platform that I use. It's called Learn Worlds. And he got really interested in it and has done a fantastic job. You know, he was really interested in the colours and the fonts and the layout and all of that sort of stuff. So he helps me and he always, you know, edits my newsletter and has a look for any typos and that's, but yeah, but apart from that, it's just me. So I looked at quite a few different ways of hosting courses, Zenla and quite a few different ones. I looked at Udemy as well and finally came up with Learn Worlds. Now, again, I'm not saying it's probably the best, but it was a good solution for me at the time when I was looking at things, it seemed to be Good. so and i've been really happy with them their customer service is really excellent they you know if you've got a problem with anything technical they answer very very quickly and they've got a nice site and they have a lot of uh, helpful tutorials and things and i think that the experience for the learner is pretty good i think you know when you log in it's all there and it's nice and it works and the play is nice and once you go in it tracks your progress and all of that sort of thing. So yeah, I've been really happy with it. I now pay about £700 a year for Learn Worlds when Moodle was free, essentially, nearly free. That was another thing that kind of slowed my progress down, I suppose. I kind of went, oh, should I, should I? For ages, I went, should I, shouldn't I? And finally, I went, look, let's just do it. And it definitely, now, now, with the income I have from the site, it seems like small potatoes. But when I moved, it seemed like a big amount of money. So I guess it's, you know, but it definitely... It's all of these things that you have to invest a little bit in terms of things like sending blue and, and you know, the website and all those. But there are some things it's worth investing in a bit, I think, that pay dividends. You mentioned Udemy. I think it's a completely different way of um, working compared to having your website. What are the advantages and uh, disadvantages of uh, working on your own on your website or working for the big guys? I mean, when I started with Udemy, the, the, the big advantage, I suppose, is that you've got a platform and they will promote your stuff. If you Google anything in Udemy, you know, you're bombarded with adverts for weeks. So that's great. And obviously the platform's there and there's a lot of support and support within the community. At one point, I did go down the road of sort of starting to set that up and I imported quite a lot of the videos that I was already selling on. And I had my logo in the bottom corner of the screen and they went, nah, 
kind of that. So they don't want anything which takes people out of you to me and, and somewhere else, I guess is fair enough. But I, I thought, well, I'm not prepared to redo all the videos. Uh, so that just kind of died a death, really. I know that there are several people who are, you know, my competitors who who have similar grammar courses, or maybe not similar, of course they're not similar, anything like as good, um, but who have grammar courses on, on Udemy. And I noticed that they're always severely reduced in price. And I think, I, I'm not 100% sure how this works, but I think that you have to tick a box. I seem to remember you have to tick a box that says, you know, Udemy can reduce the price of my course. I could sell a lot if I was selling it for two pounds a pop, but I wouldn't make an awful lot of money because you've got to sell however many you've got to sell if you're not charging very much. If you're asking that question about what the advantages is, advantages, it's about control. I'm a bit of a control freak. I like to be in control. I like to know what I'm doing. And so that really means that even if I'm a bit smaller and I don't get that same kind of promotion, I can choose what I do. So I think that was important to me. Mm. The freedom to do whatever you want. You know, you could try it in different ways. How do you structure a course? And uh, how do you know that it's valuable for your customers? So in terms of the structure of the thing, my, my courses are almost all video based. I mean, I think there's a great value in some text based material. And I think there's a value in a mix of things. And there's a value in, you know, quizzes and interactive things as well. The feedback that I get from people is that they like the video stuff because it feels as if you're really there with them. They feel a personal attachment to you. If I'm sitting there kind of explaining to people, people have often used words like reassuring, you know, calming or personal, you know, these sort of things. So I think that, you know, structuring a course so that it has a, just in the same way as a lesson would be structured, it's got a beginning, a middle and end, that's got objectives that you're trying to achieve throughout it. These things are helpful. And what I've started to do in my more recent courses is to include a tape script, a video script, transcript after each video. And that I think is helpful because people quite like to watch the video, I think. But also, if you want to watch it again, you might think, oh, I remember she said something, but I, I don't want to watch the whole thing again. You know, and so just to be able to sort of skim through or make some notes or cut and paste some notes from the transcript, I think people have found helpful. So I think a variety of stuff is useful in terms of structuring a course. You know, with these courses that, you know, are £10 or whatever, well, ultimately you get what you pay for. <laughs> so there are some courses which are excellent and free. Some of the things like on Future Learn and that sort of thing where they've been, you know, where Cambridge are making or universities are making them and they're doing it because they're, you know, for, they've got a budget to do it or because they're trying to promote their courses or whatever else. So there are definitely some excellent, brilliant free materials out there. Lots and lots and lots. If you pay for ten, yeah, you know, £10 for a TEFL course, well, you might as well just go and do look at the British Council site probably. I mean, my feeling is that any training is better than no training. But, you know, just reading through a PDF is not going to make you a good teacher. You know, when I started teaching, I, mean, I'm, I don't want to be too hypocritical because when I started teaching, I was a backpacker in Southeast Asia, ran out of money, and went to Taiwan with a degree in agriculture. I knew nothing about English teaching at all and people said oh it's fine because you speak the language well you know that's not really true but I was lucky I got a job in a very supportive school and they helped me and I did develop and then obviously I did other qualifications there are lots of people who are still doing that lots of people who are English speakers who are going to places or online or whatever and are just doing it because they're they can speak the language and so from that point of view if you start from base zero then anything's better than nothing I think but clearly there are lots of things which are better than £10 PDF. We talked a lot. Can you promote a bit your activities? Thank you. That's nice of you. My website's blt-training.com and it's got materials for pre-service teachers and in-service teachers. So I, I'm a CELTA tutor and so a lot of the stuff that I have for pre-service teachers is about CELTA. For example, how to apply for CELTA, how to do well at CELTA, uh, grammar for language teachers, if you're feeling a bit nervous about gr grammatical nomenclature, which is a really common, problem, really common problem for CELTA trainees. Um, also lesson planning and language analysis courses and concept checking course. Um, there's also a free video every week. I put new videos up every week and I just put up a new course, which I'm very proud of, which is called Teaching Grammar Communicatively, which is aimed at in-service teachers. 
and it's thoughts for how to ensure that your grammar teaching doesn't become lecture like and how you can involve learners and encourage them to participate and give them lots of meaningful practice. So it's something I feel quite passionately about. Uh, I'm really pleased with the course. I think it's the best thing I've done. I get better at making these videos as we go along. And I'm, I'm very pleased with how it's come out. So please do go and have a look at that. And I say I have a newsletter every week. So um, if you sign up on the site, you'll get a newsletter every Sunday with some new material and some reminds some old material and uh, links to something else interesting on the net usually. Joe, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely lovely to talk to you, Bartolo. Thank you for having me. And uh, I am Bartolo Ansaldi for Gallery Teachers, and our very special guest for today was Joe Kakonga of ELT Training. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and help us grow as a community. If uh, you have something important to say about the TAFL industry, you are very welcome to write it to us at editorial at galleryteachers.com and maybe write an article for our blog. And that's all for today. Thank you for staying with us. And until next time, happy teaching and happy learning. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. That was great. I really enjoyed it.